B. Happened to see a MiG-28 do a 4G negative dive. Negative 4Gs? Your head would explode. Hey, my name is Matthew Buckley. My call sign's Wiz. I flew the FA-18 Hornet for the United States Navy for about 15 years. I'm at home, and you're watching The Breakdown. First up, we have Pearl Harbor. Welcome back. Watching this gets my heart racing. What these brave guys did the morning of December 7, 1941 reminds me of September 11, 2001. I was getting ready for my first flight uh, as a pilot for American Airlines, and I was also a pilot in, uh, flying the F-18 for the Naval Air Reserve out of Naval Air Station Fort Worth, Texas, and I knew we were under attack. I jumped in my car, raced out to the base. One of my buddies got out there. We called down to maintenance and said, Chief, fuel the aircraft. And we ended up briefing in their command post. And as we were briefing, two Navy guys, four S-16 Air National Guard guys, uh, the Pentagon got hit. It was my December 7th, uh, was 2001. So watching these guys get airborne and trying to protect uh, the United States, it definitely hits home to me. Very realistic. And it gets my heart racing a little bit. The procedure that they're going through right there to get into battle is pretty accurate for the situation that they're in. Clearly, in fighter aviation, you want to have a planning session, you want to sit down and brief, you want to tell the maintenance crews what time you're going to take off, what type of weapon loadout you need in the aircraft. Obviously this morning all of that went out the window. This was arm the aircraft, we need to get airborne, strap me in, clear everybody out of the way. So actually only five American fighter aircraft got airborne to face that Japanese onslaught. Yeah, you'd be able to see, and not necessarily through the smoke immediately when you're in it, but as you can see, the Japanese pilots obviously had situational awareness as to what was going on. So from the ground, it probably looks like a lot of smoke and they can't see. Well, it's going to be the speeds they're moving, 100, 200 miles an hour. They're flying right through the smoke. So they're in it and then briefly out of it. So the smoke's really no issue to them. You got to split them up, Danny. You take left, I'll take right. So this clip from Pearl Harbor is actually very, very realistic. There actually were two Army aviators that got airborne on the morning of December 7th, uh, George Welch and Kenneth Taylor. You got to love these two guys. They were at a dance, and then they went to an all-night cocktail party. And as they tell it, 751, boom, waking up to explosions, to enemy aircraft racing overhead, to being strafed. And they hopped in uh, the one guy's Buick still had their tuxedo pants out and they raced out to Hylia Airfield where they manned two P-40 aircraft. They got airborne and Welch was actually hit. Japanese bullet hit his canopy, went into his arm and the shrapnel went into his leg. After getting wounded, the guy shot down two Japanese aircraft. They actually landed, refueled, got some more ammo and got airborne. Between those two absolute heroes, they shot down six enemy aircraft, which was it's just absolute incredible. I still got two behind me, Wade. So that's a little sporty, flying that low. <laughs> so obviously, there's telephone poles around there with telephone wire. And when you're moving at that speed, if you hit a telephone wire, you can lose your rudder or one of your control surfaces or go straight through you. But uh, there was some low-flying aircraft that day, but that's putting dirt on the propeller, so to speak. Right, they're all over me. I can't get them off me. Danny, I still got three on my tail. So at this point, both of them yelling that they both have enemy aircraft on their tail is a little of master of the obvious at this point. So it really doesn't help too much during a combat situation, which is tense enough already for you to be screaming over the radio, let alone telling your buddy what he probably knows or he's going through right now. So there's a little, little extra chatter over the radio at this point, which probably doesn't add to anybody's situational awareness. Daddy, let's play some chicken with these suckers. Go left, now! If you're dogfighting, 
in practice and for real, you want to be as close as you can to somebody. It, it isn't necessarily chicken because somebody actually has to flinch because if you just stay pointing at each other, you're both going to get credited with a kill, air to air kill, but you're also going to both be dead. So no chicken, but it makes, makes for good Hollywood. So dog fighting is a term that we use to describe trying to get behind an enemy opponent's what we call six o'clock directly behind them. Back in the day, that's how you would try and shoot down your enemy opponent, either with a gun or a missile. In today's fighter aircraft, you want to be shooting this guy down X amount of miles away. We call it BVR, beyond visual range. These guys are in a dogfight right now in what we call WVR, within visual range. But this is this is a bad day at the office in current fighter aviation if you're having to play chicken with, <laughs> with the enemy aircraft. Now let's head over to Battleship Row. I'm with you. So in this scene, it depicts, I'd say, the bravado and the heroism of fighter pilots, your nation under attack and in the blink of an eye reacting. If you notice, in reality, in, in this movie, they weren't waiting for their commanding officer to give them an order. It was time to act. So the, uh, the enlisted personnel, the ground crew arming the aircraft, uh, the guys hopping in the aircraft, that's the spirit of fighter pilots. Up next, we have Top Gun. As a naval aviator and a graduate of Top Gun, the adversary course, if you even mention this movie in the ready room of a fighter squadron, it's like a $50 fine, or you have to buy every guy in the squadron a drink. A lot of what goes on in this movie is just simply <laughs> unrealistic. Great Hollywood, but not, not actually what goes on in naval aviation. SP-300, go get him, ma'am. I'm going for missile lock. Right off the bat here, the guy in back, Goose in this case, is what we call a RIO, a radar intercept officer, who in modern aircraft has been replaced by a computer. So right now, Goose is being a high-speed cheerleader. Come on, lock up, baby. Lock up, baby. Lock up. I got him locked. So what we're seeing on the screen right now is obviously a fake Hollywoodized version of what we call the HUD, the heads up display. And what Maverick is attempting to do here, and he was trying to select what we call a sidewinder, which is a heat seeking missile. So you'll hear throughout the movie various tones in Maverick and, and Goose headsets. So all over the fighter aircraft, we have like little dimples, we call them. So if anybody watching has a radar detector in their car, you know that it gives different signals and uh, different based on the strength and the band of radar. Same thing in a fighter aircraft. And the missiles in this case, a heat seeker that we call a sidewinder is looking for the enemy's engine. So it locks on that heat source. And when it's locked on, you get what we call a screaming tone. Actually in the F-18 Hornet, once it's locked up like that, it says shoot. So it's kind of idiot proof. Locked up, shoot. We got him, Mav. He's bugging out and going home. Mustang, this is Maverick. Big two is headed home. So if you see the enemy aircraft right there, you heard a little tone in that guy's headset as well. So enemy aircraft are kind of built like our aircraft and maybe we steal some of their plans, they steal ours. And we kind of, they're all maybe built or have the similar systems. And so in today's fighter environment, there's what we call secure communications or scrambled. And so it is kind of a spy versus spy uh, mentality. It's all about trying to disable the enemy's ability to communicate or for their systems to work, right? I'd, I'd want to jam this guy's radar so he can't lock me up. All right, what's their position? 180 miles, bearing 010, zero zero, sir. So even if you're a pretty high ranking officer on an aircraft carrier, ain't no smoking on board an aircraft carrier. In the command and control center where there's very high tech electronics, they're not allowing any smoke to get into those things and, and break down. In the 80s, there was less sophisticated technology and believe it or not, uh, in the ready room in my fighter squadron still had ashtrays in them. Fighter pilots and smoking uh, was kind of a thing, but man, that died out a while ago. So it might've been semi acceptable on an aircraft carrier in the 80s, uh, definitely not today. Cougar, he's got missile lock on us. Get away from this guy. So that tone's going off in his headset, and if you notice, it was kind of a different tone than when Maverick locked up the enemy. So there's different tones in your headset and on your displays because there's different types of radar. Now, if you're locked up by a radar and they're activating their potential missile launch, now you're gonna get a screaming tone. So you actually have to be pretty smart about what type of tone, and also it's going to tell you based on uh, that radar luck, who it is or what type of aircraft or weapon that's about to get fired at you. Damn 
Comet Mustang. This is Ghost Rider 117. This bogey's all over me. He's got missile lock on me. Do I have permission to fire? Do not fire until fired upon. As a fighter pilot, this is where we throw some popcorn at the screen, uh, screen if, if we're watching this. So the guy's completely what we call defensive. He's got an enemy aircraft at his six o'clock. The enemy aircraft has a radar lock on him and is about to fire. And the guy's saying, hey, can I, can I shoot him down? The F-14 Tomcat in the, in the mid to early 80s did not have a missile that can take off and fly behind you and shoot the guy down behind you. So it's a little comical that at this point he's, he's requesting permission to fire when he's about to get shot down. And then the rules of engagement. You have to get fired upon in order to defend yourself and shoot back. There are some commander in chiefs and some what we call ROE which is rules of engagement that say, if you get locked up by an enemy's radar that is a target tracking or, hey, you're about to get killed type of radar, that is considered a hostile act. When I flew over Operation Southern Watch over Southern Iraq, that was one of our, on our checklist. The rules of engagement aren't written by the women and men in uniform. They're written by, guess what? The politicians and military attorneys. So this is a really interesting scene where, hey, don't fire unless fired upon. Well, it looks like this guy's about to get fired upon. <laughs> Goose, there they are, right below us. The MiG's in perfect firing position. He's right on Cougar's tail. No way, Goose. He'd have fired by now. He's just trying to piss us off. So the F-14 Tomcat was defined as a air superiority fighter. So the guy in the back, in this case Goose, he is operating the radar system to lock up the uh, aircraft. And obviously the pilot, and he talks over the radios. So obviously Maverick, the pilot, stick and runner. He's flying the airplane. But in the Tomcat, the, the backseater, Goose, could still fire an air-to-air -air weapon. But in this case, obviously within visual range in a dogfighting situation, the pilot, Maverick, would be the one shooting the gun and also firing the missiles. Maverick, get down here and get this off me. So it's interesting, in the movie Top Gun that we have Maverick, then we're gonna meet Iceman and Wolfman and all these, you know, Gucci call signs, so to speak. Let's just say that not most fighter pilots are running around with a call sign that they like or gave themselves. My call sign's Wiz, and it has nothing to do with intelligence, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> So usually you get your call sign by doing something stupid or it's a play on your last name. We love the call signs in Top Gun because ain't no Mavericks or Icemans or Wolfmans running around in Navy, Marine, or Air Force aviation. This is very Hollywoodish. Bring it back hard right. Help me engage. I'm on my way. So the flying scenes, just fantastic. Some people sit here, hey, well, well, you know, why aren't we, why isn't he shooting this guy right now? Number one, because of the rules of engagement, the guy hasn't shot yet, and also because he's got his wingman right in front of his wing windscreen and he can't shoot. So apparently he's gonna go have some fun with him. Is this your idea of fun, man? Greetings. <laughs> First of all, it was a single seat MIG and mysteriously there's, uh, it's a two seat MIG <laughs> that just, uh, I guess a guy just magically popped up in the back seat. Also, if you look at about how close the two aircraft are in some other scenes, you can see that the F-14 Tomcat, the tail has got to be at least 54 feet off the ground. We jokingly called the, to uh, the Tomcat the flying tennis court. The, the airplane was massive. So at this point, based on where the vertical stabilizer of the F-14 would be, they would have already had a mid-air collision. So this is just epically hysterical uh, at this point. Uh, obviously very Hollywoodized, uh, you wouldn't be uh, doing something like this. Later in the movie, one of the funniest lines uh, in this movie is, hey, you were in a negative 4G dive with a MiG-28. We happen to see a MiG-28 do a 4G negative dive. So if you don't know what negative G's are, is like when you, you're flying over the railroad tracks and, and you get light in your seat or at the top of a roller coaster. It's, it's, we call it eyes out G, meaning positive G, the blood's leaving your head and you can pass out. Negative G, the blood's actually going into your head and we call it eyes out G because hell, your eyes could pop out at a certain point. A, a negative G, negative couple G's, that's painful. I mean, I've, I've had, broken blood vessels in my eyes because uh, of this. Negative four G's, your head would explode. <laughs> so, and not only negative four G's would your head pop
pop off its brain stem, they said you, you are in a negative 4G dive. It's physiologically and physically impossible to do what is depicted. Watch the birdie. Jeez, I cracked myself up. Since you're goose and you have nothing else to do as a backseater, you probably would bring a Polaroid, but no. So we did have a camera that we uh, take in the F-18 uh, because you did need to take pictures sometimes of, you know, an enemy aircraft you'd intercept or even a suspicious vessel. So Polaroid, not so much. Real camera, yeah, we'd actually have cameras in the aircraft. I was a junior in high school when the first movie came out, and I knew since I wanted to breathe, I wanted to be a Navy fighter pilot. All of a sudden, this movie came out, and everybody, including my mother, wanted to be a Navy fighter pilot. So it was great for recruiting, for fighter aviation. It's great theater. We love it. But at the end of the day, Maverick wouldn't have lasted five minutes in a real fighter squadron. I can't wait to see the, uh, the new one. So I have a couple buddies who did a lot of the flying. It's going to be good. Next up, Behind Enemy Lines. Break the lock. Golden Eagle Archangel, we have been engaged. Roger. Put out decoys, Copy. Okay, so great clip here in Behind Enemy Lines. First of all, this has got to be the longest time I've ever seen a surface-to-air missile fly. <laughs> These things can fly, some of them, five times faster than a fighter jet, but this one seems to be able to fly for about an hour here. And what we just saw was this F-18 put out a bunch of flares and also what we call chaff and also jamming pods. If you're a heat-seeking missile, you're staring at this engine heat. I'm going to go hit that engine and blow it up, and all of a sudden a bunch of hotter things pop out. If it's a radar missile, and you're going after an aircraft and you're locked on and all of a sudden you see a bigger radar image pop up, maybe you'll go lock on to that and away from the aircraft. And the final thing that might be popping out of this aircraft is what we call jammers. So little electronic jammers that hopefully scramble this missile's brains and make it not hit you. So at this point, these guys in this F-18F are defensive. They have the next 10 seconds of their life to try and decoy this missile. So back on board the ship, that's the probably what we call CIC, the Combat Information Center, the heart of an aircraft carrier or a surface ship, wherever the combatant commander is. So whoever, wherever the admiral is or uh, the commander of the battle group, uh, that's all that blue lighting or red lighting and all the sensors in that room. They're probably writing down the aircraft position, time, and getting the stats of what's going on in this engagement. Jesus Christ, second missile in here! Three miles in closing! Pull up! Change your back I got him, I got him! So this is a little bit more realistic than Top Gun. You can see a little bit more of the displays inside the aircraft. It's tracking at you and giving you a little distance. So you can tell the technology advantage that we have in the F-18 Hornet than we did over the F-14. Still in this movie, Behind Enemy Lines, we got a goose in the back this time, another radar intercept officer. They changed the term from Rio to Wizzo, Weapons System Operator. So this guy in the back right now, talking over the radio, putting out chaff and flare, and trying to help the pilot with some situational awareness. But a little, little better than the movie Top Gun, you can see what's going on in the aircraft. So as I said, we're on about hour two of this missile flying. Surface air missiles, man, are fast. And like I said, some of them five times faster than I can going downhill with a tailwind. So these things probably would have hit them by now. But if you can look out over your shoulder and see this missile kind of hanging out and just barely closing, <laughs> it's, it's a little cartoonish at this point, but you know, it's, it's, it's Hollywood. He's probably either trying to be supersonic or subsonic. We have a saying in fighter aviation that speed is life. You can always get rid of airspeed. You can always pull G or pull the throttles back. So the mask, the main reason you're wearing a mask, obviously, clearly is oxygen if it's needed at higher altitudes, but also for communication. So your microphone is, in fact, in the mask. And the mask is held onto your face, obviously, by the helmet. The helmet's not for, like, crash protection. It's not super durable. It's just a helmet that has ear cups, and then your mask has the microphone in it, and you're breathing percent uh, oxygen at that point. So let's go back a little bit. I want to take a look at this. Ah! 
one mile! Stop the fuel tank and pull out! When you're talking about the movie Top Gun, there was a couple times in the movie, for example, when Maverick touched down on the flight deck, pulled back on the stick, and pulled back on the throttles to get airborne. Last time I checked flying the F-18, when you pull back on the throttles, the power goes back. So he would have fallen off the, uh, the aircraft flight deck. So in this scene right here, he's dropping his drop tanks to blow them up to maybe decoy these enemy heat-seeking missiles. Watch what he also does. He actually pulls back the throttles and you can see the afterburners go out. So now, big fireball and the heat-seeking missiles are going to go after that instead of his aircraft. So clearly these weren't radar seeking missiles, right? They were heat seeking missiles if they got decoyed by that heat. It's not possible to outrun it. It could be possible to outmaneuver it or to decoy it with the chaff, the flares, or the jammers. You're not gonna outrun a missile. Most missiles are faster than the fastest aircraft on this planet. There are technology out there where it says, hey, I'm seeing a bunch of stuff flying out of this airplane that's hot. Maybe I should ignore those and stick with the aircraft. I haven't flown in a long time, so that technology is probably way past uh, wherever I was flying. I got two missiles in sight, both tracks for the fireball. That's it, one down, up we go. So one of the missiles got decoyed by the fireball. There's a finite amount of rocket fuel in this thing, and it's been flying for a a good calendar year right now. Somebody's gonna gonna have a really bad day here because the second one didn't. He's coming back, Mr. Larkin, right, right, right. I got no turn left, Chris. Control the shot. Go straight, straight. So as fighter pilot, you have to be in top shape, top physical shape, especially your legs and your stomach. Because as you pull positive Gs, the blood is rushing out of your head. It's called the hick maneuver. So you want to squeeze your legs and your abs to squeeze the blood to keep it in your head. What's the first thing that goes when you pass out? Your vision. We would fight the jet on the edge of consciousness. I'd pull a lot of G's and I'd fight the jet on the edge of what we call gray out. I can still fly. I'm still talking over the radio, maneuvering my hands, but I'm actually losing sight of the guy. So as I kind of gray out, I'll unload a little bit, let some blood get back into my vision. Oh, there he is, and pull even more. That's how much you want to win. And you're also wearing what we call a G-suit. They look like very, very tight jeans, so to speak, go over your flight suit, and it, they're actually plugged into the aircraft, and they use engine bleed air. So the more G I pull, these jeans inflate, and they squeeze your legs even more. So you can see in this air-to-air -air engagement, it's very, very physically demanding. Also during this, as you're seeing uh, these guys maneuver, the adrenaline rush is through the roof. They got the next couple seconds of their lives, literally, to, to defeat this thing. So you're really not even feeling the physiological effects of the Gs at this point. It's just doing it. So behind enemy lines compared to Top Gun, definitely a lot more realistic, a little bit more of the discipline, and also the, uh, the search and rescue. And it shows the more Navy uh, Marine Corps team. Hey folks, thanks for watching these clips with me. Stand by for part two and be safe out there.